Moving forward. This talk is about emerging cultures of mobility, and uh, I want to think about why in the United States we seem so fixed in car culture and what I call automobility. It's very, it can be very um, disheartening that it seems like we'll never change um, and that we have this system which um, some call sort of a dinosaur system based on fossil fuels. Um, on the other hand, there does seem to be some hope that there is the beginnings of a transition. So I wanted to think about where are the possible openings of a transition starting and where is it leading? What, how will we change and when will that change um, take place? So what are the prospects for new cultures of mobility in the United States? And of course we know that the United States in a way is behind some other countries in terms of using more fuel efficient vehicles um, and the, the sort of um, landscape itself is more dominated by cars than many European landscapes. Um, so I, I started thinking um, about this dominant culture of automobility and how it's kind of built into our, our forms of um, where we live, our dwellings, our neighborhoods, um, but also our patterns of familial life, of um, friendship, of networks, of how we connect with people, how families move around and, and join up with each other. So that car cultures um, are not just a sort of about a transportation choice, but they have all of these dimensions of affective or emotional resonance because we think of them as a way to, you know, keep our children safe or a way to help our, you know, our grandparents get around. Um, and, all, and so the choice to drive a car is not really a rational choice. It's part of these emotional ties and these um, networks of sociability. Um, and it's also a kind of embodied sensibility that's embedded in our whole way of life in the United States. Um, so it's very hard to say, oh, well, you know, you should just ride a bike or you should try walking um, because the car is so closely linked to these whole modes of life, these ways of living. And how can, we, how can we change that without deeper cultural shifts? So I looked back a little bit at, okay, when have there been efforts to change our car culture in the United States? And one example is in the 1970s, we had a law um, nationally to reduce the speed limit from 70 miles per hour to 55 miles per hour on national highways. And that law um, reduced the number of crashes and fatalities. It, it in, increased our fuel efficiency of our sort of overall fleet of cars nationally. But um, the, the law was introduced because of the oil crisis and the rise in prices. And when that sort of subsided um, under the presidency of Ronald Reagan, the law was overturned. And we went back to raising our speed limit again and we forgot the kind of lessons of the oil crisis. And in fact, we had briefly had smaller cars, but we went back again to larger cars. And what's happened is we've also developed technologies that make cars more fuel efficient. So instead of driving a smaller and more fuel efficient car, we took those technologies and we said, oh, well, we can make a bigger car now. We'll make a bigger, faster car, but it will be a little bit more efficient than the old bigger cars. Um, so we ended up sort of counteracting any good that it could have come from any of those policies. So I call that the kind of stubborn stability of automobility. It, it won't go away. Um, we've also had opportunities t for people to ride bikes more, and there's been promotions of bicycling and building more bike infrastructure. But in many U.S. cities, it's created what some people call bike wars which are wars between bicyclists and drivers, or wars between bicyclists and pedestrians. And a lot of people don't like the bicyclists and they don't want the bicycle infrastructure. Um, and there, it's really only very, very recently that it, there's been some sort of major changes on that front in cities like New York. Um, to some extent in Philadelphia, it's starting to happen, but it's taken very, very active um, municipal government 
um, and policymakers to promote these kinds of changes. And it still seems like a very um, uneven um, transition. So I wrote about some of these issues in uh, a chapter in a book called Automobility in Transition, a Socio-Technical Analysis of Sustainable Transport. Um, it's edited by Rene Kemp, Jeff Dudley, Frank Giels, and Glenn Lyons. Um, so in this book, they use, uh, or we use, what's called a, a multi-level transition perspective. And I want to just talk about that a little bit because it's, for me, it's a way of understanding the complexity of why things are difficult to change. Because in the multi-level perspective, we have, um, we start with a niche level, which is kind of everyday experimentation with alternative mobilities. And we have um, people trying to do things like uh, walking more or cycling or transit-oriented development, um, promoting what, we're, what are called complete streets or livable cities. And there are many movements in the United States which are trying to do all of those things. But the niche level is just kind of local and it's small and it doesn't affect the system as a whole. The next level is what we call the regime level. The regime is where you have these more um, sort of dominant interests, which are both the industries and um, things like car makers, oil um, refiners and, and oil drilling companies. Um, and also govern, government, and how those are kind of locked into a sort of existing regime that's institutionalized. And that's harder to change. So you might be able to change the individual and give them alternatives um, and new technologies, but how do you change the regime level culture, um, which is more locked in? And then lastly, above that, we have what's called the landscape level. And the landscape level changes even more slowly. Those are things like, um, resources, energy, access to oil, climate change, um, the sort of large geological processes. Um, but also, I think of these, all of these levels as being cultural also. So you can have the sort of everyday practices of embodied um, movement at the niche level. And then at the regime level, you can have kind of how things are culturally framed. What are the um, ways of understanding and contesting different um, cultures of mobility? But at the land landscape level, we have these kind of master discourses, these, these um, things that guide our understanding of mobility. And those change very slowly. So for example, the idea that mobility equals freedom. Um, is, is hard to change. You can't, you can't make that go away. Um, or things like that we, we need to value things um, economically or rationally to make decisions. Those are the kind of landscape level cultural frames. Um, so culture in this view is not just a tool or it's not just a kind of resource that's used by actors, but it's also a performative part of how our environment and our technology is materialized. It's kind of an embedded culture. It's built into our world and it's built into our understandings of the world. So uh, looking back then at the United States, um, we have surveys that show how do Americans get to work, for example, commuting. 77% um, of people in these surveys uh, from the U.S. Census Bureau, drive alone in a car to work, 77%. That's a huge percentage. Another 10% carpool, only about uh, less than 4% use public transportation, 2.5% um, walk to work, and only 0.4%, I think it's up to 0.5% now, bicycle. So huge amount of people driving alone still. And yet when they do um, some surveys of American voters, for example, uh, recently, a Transportation for America survey found that 66% of the people surveyed wanted options besides driving, and 58% favored spending more on public transportation, and 51% were willing to have their taxes increased to improve mass transit, and 82% said that the United States would benefit from an expanded and improved transportation system such as rail and buses. So it seems like there's a push for change. There's people who would like things to change, but 73% said they currently feel they have no choice but to drive as much as they do. 
So despite our desire to change, we feel we have no choice. We feel we're stuck in this mode. Um, so what are the possible openings? What are the ways of changing this? People um, have envisioned different ways to go about this. And there are movements of non-governmental organizations like uh, the National Complete Streets Coalition, Transportation for America, Smart Growth America, um, street, the Streets Blog and the Livable Streets Initiative. These are all groups who are promoting different ways of thinking about transit-oriented development, making walking and bicycle-friendly communities a priority, changing the way we develop our cities. Um, and in my own city in Philadelphia, there have been changes happening. Um, the, the, Citywide plan for 2035 includes uh, complete streets, intermodal stations, um, new and extended transit lines, um, and also the idea of um, smart highways and changing the way uh, we use mobile communication technologies to guide traffic. Um, so there, are, those things are changing, but we also we seem to need a more radical change. And I see two directions that this is starting to happen in the, in the United States. One example is um, from the MIT Media Lab, who have created what they call a mobility on demand system. And that involves all of these, uh, this would be for an inner central city area, and it involves small electric vehicles that would be shared in a, in a networked system. It would be both motorbikes and small, small cars that actually fold up and when they're parked and can, you can fit them into a small space. Um, and then there'd be a sort of um, a networked uh, car sharing system or vehicle sharing system to access these vehicles. And I think one vision is that we would have high speed rail connecting our cities and then have these kinds of shared mobility on demand systems inside the cities. That's one future, future scenario. But the other future scenario that seems to have more support in the United States, including backing from the Department of Transportation, is an idea of uh, what are called intelligent highways. And on these intelligent highways, we would basically um, give up control of our cars. We would still be in our private vehicles, but the control of them would be given over to the highway itself, and it would be an automated um, driverless system. And a lot of research money is being put into these um, driverless automated highway systems, which is a dream that goes back to the you know, 1930s um, and all through the 20th century there's been the dream of the automated highway. But we're getting closer to it. We're getting closer to the technologies that will enable both the vehicles and the road infrastructure to basically take control of driving. Um, and where I see that leading is that we will then no longer associate driving a car with freedom because we won't be you know, on the free and open road driving along in the desert. Um, instead, we'll just be in these controlled systems. And in fact, many of the control systems are military technologies. So the military is heavily invested in creating uh, driverless vehicles, um, things like drones we see already flying around, but they want to sort of bring that down to the road system. Um, so my conclusion is that what will might, might actually lead to the transition in our mobility system is not green or sustainable um, transformations and um, a sort of movement towards um, walking and bicycling, but it may actually be these new technologies um, that bring in new forms of governance and control of mobility. And they might have unexpected um, outcomes um, and sort of other ways in which they're culturally problematic that are different than the problems we have now, but may not be such a um, desirable solution ultimately.